thank you for showing up. It's a cozy company, so it's very nice. Um, so I will try to maybe be brief, and if you have any questions, then I can try to answer you. So many of you already know me. We met here. I'm Erasmus Staff Exchange here at uh, the University of Las Palmas, and I'm from the University of Eastern Finland uh, and Karelian Institute, the division in there. So. Um, First of all, a week ago, Bernard Lane was starting his lecture by pointing out that he's a geographer and then telling what geographers cannot do. <laughs> I am a geographer, <laughs> but today I will try to recover the image of a geographer and show you what geographers can do. So uh, my approach to second home ownership, which is a very marginal type of tourism, is very geographical. So you are very welcome to give me a tourism perspective uh, and any comments on that. Um, so, yeah, here I am doing project on second homes with Teresa Aguiar, and we study German second homes in Gran Canaria, but today I won't talk about that, but I can if you want to hear more, but I do Russian second homes in Finland, and today I will be talking more about that. But first of all, let me uh, say a couple of words about my university since I'm on official visit here and represent my institution. So University of Eastern Finland has three campuses in uh, Joensuu, Kuopio and Savonlinna and I will show you some maps because <laughs> geographers like maps. Uh, we have four faculties and about 15,000 degree students. Uh, every year we also get about 1,000 exchange uh, degree students um, so, uh, if you look on the map of Finland, here we can see uh, Joensu, the city that I'm coming from, uh, Kuopio and Savolina. And here are pictures of the Joensu campus. Uh, so, to put you on the map, Helsinki is over here, Rovaniemi is somewhere over here, so we are still far away from Lapland. <laughs> we are not in the Lapland. Um, so Joensu and Kuopio are approximately the same size campuses. Samolina will be shut down and united with Joensu, I think uh, starting from next year. And Samolina was the place where we had Center for Tourism Studies, which will become a part of the uh, business uh, department. Uh, and it's officially or technically already a part of it. Uh, so here we have the faculties, Philosophical, Faculty of Science and Forestry. We have a very strong forestry um, research in, uh, in our university. Uh, health sciences, uh, health research is mostly in Kuopio. And Faculty of Social and Sciences and Business Studies, where I come from. I uh, did my doctoral degree at the Department of Geographical and Historical Studies. And now I work in the Karelian Institute as a postdoctoral researcher. And uh, the tourism studies are nowadays under the business school, which is also the same faculty. And good news, uh, this uh, autumn uh, business school starts a brand new uh, tourism uh, master's program in tourism marketing, one and only in Finland. And my, uh, the professor from uh, the program, the coordinator, Raya Kompula, sent an email that Everyone is welcome on Erasmus uh, teaching exchange and Desiderio from your faculty. Desiderio, what's his last name? Yeah, he's coming to teach in September. Yeah, so he's coming to teach in the program already. So if you want to know more and hear more, I, I'm happy to uh, send you more information. So four global challenges or four strategic areas of research, as we call it, are aging, lifestyle, and health. Uh, learning in digital society, uh, cultural encounters, mobilities and borders, and environmental change and um, um, governance of natural, na natural resources. So I uh, am somewhere between uh, mobilities, borders, and life lifestyle, my uh, area of research. So Karelian Institute is a research institute which is basically self-funded fun fun uh, because uh, researchers, they work on projects and they are working there because they have projects. If you don't have projects, you are not employed, basically. So uh, we have very few permanent uh, positions there. Uh, we have six professors. I think they are permanent. And for, from 40 to 50 researchers, again, depending on the projects. 
So research areas of our institute uh, borders in Russia. As you saw on the map, we are very close to Russia. Yon, so it's 70 kilometers away from the Finnish-Russian border. Culture, ethnicity, regional rural studies. We also have Center for Russian and Border Studies based in our institution and Center for Regional Research. So um, I do Russians and I do transborder mobility. That's why I'm <laughs> in the Karelian Institute. So um, going to the topic now, uh, leisure mobility and second homes. Um, so uh, now uh, we are witnessing basically the biggest uh, mobility in all times, that people increasingly move because of freedom of choice to do so, uh, because they want to change in lifestyle um, or self-fulfillment. And along the mass tourism and mass mobility of people, uh, the uh, international uh, property purchases, uh, be it a recreational property, second home, or investment property is also increasing. It's a growing trend uh, in different parts of the world. Oh, and um, also uh, it's important, in my opinion, because I studied the topic, and in general, uh, South uh, African researchers pointed out that it's important to study second homes, as second home geographers provide uh, additional valuable perspective on uh, explaining the specialities. Um, of also many rural areas, if we look uh, on the Finnish context or in Gran Canaria, also the speciality of tourism areas because second homes in Gran Canaria are basically concentrated in those touristic areas where mass tourism uh, are located as well. So there are many terms that interchangeably used to define or to, to define or categorize a second home. We can have seasonal home, country house, second residence, cabin, cottage, free time residence, winter residence, summer residence, you name it. So basically, uh, these are terms that can be made in the literature, but second home is an umbrella term to define all these uh, varieties of um, um, varieties of um, uh, variety of terms. So second homes are uh, defined as non-mobile properties that are owned or rented on a long lease as occasional residence uh, of a household that usually lives elsewhere. So among the main features um, of second homes are that it's usually property or certain type of building. It's used temporarily, people do not live there, and they use it for leisure purposes. Um, Usually, ownership uh, is mentioned as a property of a second home or as a um, characteristic of a second home, but nowadays we see many different types of um, ownership, like time sharing or long term renting. So, ownership is not um, anymore um, a compulsory uh, dif characteristic of a second home. Also, uh, second homes are usually non-mobile uh, houses, but again, the types of um, dwellings developing and caravanning and building additional uh, extended outdoor space for caravans, which is very popular in Norway, now also challenges the definition of second home as a non-mobile dwelling. Um, in different um, geographical contexts and in different national traditions, we can see that second home is can be a very different category. Here we can see San Agustin <laughs> in Gran Canaria. That second home is uh, basically an apartment in the apartment uh, block. Uh, here we can see the Finnish example, uh, which is uh, basically a detached uh, building, uh, usually small in size, and traditionally uh, a second home in Finland is a very modest uh, type of residence. However, it is also changing. Back in the days, people didn't have any amenities, so no running water, no electricity. They wanted to go and be with nature, but this is a very uh, minor percentage these days. And also, somewhere in the uh, Mediterranean, we can see that second home could be a big villa, um, also can be used uh, in, for even permanent living. 
So what researchers are suggesting these days that we should depart from categorizing second home as a particular type of dwelling, but focus on the uh, use of second homes and relationship with the dwelling. So we shouldn't look in a type of property, but basically um, uh, how the property is used. Um, so the important aspect of um, second home ownership is related to their um, connection to a wider uh, lifestyle strategies and plans of people, as well as their very uh, big part of uh, personal, spatial, and temporal mobilities. Uh, indeed, second homes can be a part of uh, lifestyle, lifestyle plans, uh, and people might uh, think of retiring in their second homes, or they can use it for uh, lifestyle migration. And I will go to lifestyle migration in a couple of slides. So, um, as I mentioned, um, property ownership across borders and uh, internationally is a growing trend. And um, now um, we see the increasing use of second homes or additional properties or recreational properties. In Finland, traditionally, second home is a summer residence. People go there in the summertime. But nowadays, uh, the standards of second homes are increasing. As we can see, it's very well equipped uh, buildings, and people even go there in winter time. Uh, people would like to retire in their second homes. And uh, distant work, uh, nowadays, possibilities of distant work also intensify um, the use of uh, second homes. When we talk about second homes, uh, in literature we can see different types of concepts defining uh, the phenomena, uh, such as residential tourism, amenity migration, retirement migration, um, seasonal migration, semi-migration, snowbirds, sunbirds, and so on and so forth. Uh, these um, uh, categories and concepts are often used interchangeably, especially second home tourism and amenity migration are very much mixed because uh, amenity migration means that people go and launch for nice amenity rich places for scenic landscape, which is also the case with second homes. However, amenity migrants might migrate to their property or might not, while second homes usually do not migrate. So it's very uh, overlapping categories. Mm let's say. And a second home uh, usually a part of such uh, concepts as multi-local living that people live in different places and second home is another home. Uh, multiple dwelling, um, second homes included in uh, this concept or plural residential, oh, I cannot even pronounce this, residentiality. Um, However, um, for me, it's important, and I think it's important in general, um, to define or differentiate the difference between lifestyle migration and second home tourism. Uh, lifestyle migrants, when we look at the definition, um, are relatively affluent individuals of all ages that even moving part-time or full-time to their places usually to first perceive a better quality of life. So its definition if it's very wide. Who are those individuals of all ages? What all ages? Um, how do you define affluence, richness of people? Um, and better quality of life. So it's a very personal category. Um, and you, uh, lifestyle migration, why do I, I don't use these concepts, is because it's about migration. So it's about permanent move, uh, mostly about permanent move to, uh, to another residence. And the examples of lifestyle migrants is Brits in the south of Spain or uh, Norwegians in the south of Spain, Finns in the south of Spain, who actually migrate and create uh, their communities there. They are lifestyle uh, migrants. Uh, second home mobility uh, differs from other lifestyle choices uh, by age. So second homeowners are not necessarily retirees who do not go to retire. A level of affluence, second home ownership is not necessarily about being rich. Uh, average people <laughs> also purchase second homes um, or middle class. Um, and also relationship between homes and types of visits. Um, we can di differentiate um, second homes uh, from other types of uh, here of 
uh, migration and other um, concepts uh, through these um, categories. So uh, for me, it was easier to, uh, <laughs> and in general, lifestyle migration, second home tourism differentiate, uh, is, uh, it's easier to differentiate uh, by the research case you have. You, the data will talk to you, and research case will talk to you, as in my context. Uh, I defended my doctoral thesis last year uh, about Russian second home ownership in Finland. And here, I don't know, do you see properly? Uh, here is here's the map of Finland, and here is my research area. And here is the Finnish-Russian border, which is the external border of the European Union. So uh, Russians cannot migrate to their second homes in Finland because we have visa regime, we have border regime. Uh, so it was easier for me. It's not lifestyle migration. It's about moving between two countries, between two properties. Um, so uh, border um, is very important in my research case. Um, and uh, as you can see from the title of my dissertation, Peace and Quiet Beyond the Border, uh, the transborder mobility of Russian second home owners in Finland. So I work with borders, mobilities, and second homes. These are uh, main uh, categories in my research. Um, let me see. Yes, uh, and main um, theoretical approach is mobility. And why mobility? Because um, we talk about uh, certain type of tourist movements between first and second home. And, um, this is second home mobility is so-called in-between mobility and usually researchers put second home mobility between mass tourism and between a permanent move to a second home or retirement migration. So it's somewhere in between and it's still mobility. It's not about migrating permanently and migration is very um, narrow concept to define many, many uh, types uh, of movements and variety of movements, uh, especially across borders. Um, uh, second homes uh, blur the division between home and away. Uh, now we have many homes. And uh, also migration is more about attachment to places and fixity to places rather than dynamism. So mobility is a, a richer concept and richer theoretical approach to define, okay, thank you, uh, to uh, interpret second homes. Uh, and I use new mobility paradigms and constellations of mobility, but I won't go into details with that, otherwise we, <laughs> we will stay here till the evening. Um, so second homes are defined as a semi-permanent geographical movement, semi-migration or circulation. So for this reason, I uh, very much look into mobility and how um, it's performed. Also borders is an important concept in my uh, study. And borders, Timothy Dallin worked with borders and tourism. And he defined borders in tourism uh, as barriers, as attraction, especially if the destination is more scenic or prestigious or as modifiers of tourism landscape. So, yeah, if you look at the European context uh, and uh, look at the examples of second home mobility or lifestyle migration or various types of moving between different homes, uh, we can define several trends. Um, one is between neighboring countries. Norwegians purchase second homes in uh, Sweden. Uh, or Norwegian, uh, Swedes in Finland or Norwegians in Finland that are driven by uh, difference in regulations, maybe more attractive uh, prices, uh, landscape, climatic conditions. Uh, very popular trend from north to south, as we can see here also. Uh, Northern Europeans moving to the southern part of Europe. Uh, also, we see the trend from so-called uh, older European states to new European states, uh, like Germans going to Poland or Brits going to France, um, or there are even studies on Brits in uh, Slovenia. Um, uh, so, yeah, once again, uh, there are several trends, north to south, old EU states to new EU states, neighboring countries, and general consumers from more affluent states to less affluent states and regions. I also read studies about uh, breeds in Turkey, for example, so when there is um, a clear uh, case of uh, more affluent to less affluent regions. However, when we look at Russian mobility to Finland, and let me remind you that it's from here to here, so it's a bit different direction. It's from east 
to West. And if we look also at the media income in Finland and in Russia, oh, I apologize for very outdated <laughs> numbers, but still they tell the story uh, that the average income difference is very high and it's one of the highest in the world uh, between neighboring countries. But still we do not have Finns going to Russia, but the other way around. So we cannot uh, say that it's uh, about more affluent going to less affluent regions. So um, now going to my topic in more detail, uh, we can see that um, Finland is a very popular uh, country among Russians. Here is the statistics on uh, visitations. In 2013, uh, over 5 million Russians, and uh, Finland was a top destination in that year. And basically, it still st uh, stays one of the top destinations for Russians for visits. Um, and in addition to mass tourism, to visits, uh, property ownership or uh, property purchases has become a growing trend from the year of 2000. We can see Russians in red and other foreigners in blue. Uh, for the last year, please ignore the numbers because now uh, the, uh, the way they count the statistics uh, has changed. So now they include all foreigners also residing in Finland. Uh, they count all, all who purchase properties. So here I, I do not really know how many Russians purchased in 2016 who are coming from abroad. So here we can see in 2008 was a peak year, then we had the world economic crisis, a big decline, and after 2014 a total decline, again because uh, we had a Ukrainian conflict, the oil prices uh, decreased, that hit the rubble very hard. Uh, we have sanction regime between EU and Russia, so all this uh, contributes to, to decline in property purchases. Also, uh, again coming to the research area, uh, Russian property purchases are concentrated in the border area and here we have St. Petersburg which is the city basically the same size as the whole Finland in population wise so it's uh, Finland uh, a little bit less than 6 million people and the St. Petersburg is, is about 6 million just one city so we see that uh, there is a biggest <laughs> concentration is here and here is my research region just to remind you, Yoensu is here, and here is Savolina where we had the Center for Tourism Studies. Um, so um, there have been a big social debate about Russian purchases in Finland. And just a little bit of background, in the Second World War, Russia and Finland were enemies. And after the Second World War, Russia annexed about 10% of the Finnish territories resulting in uh, evacuation of about 400,000 Finns. So that created a national trauma uh, in Finland. And after the Second World War, and basically during the Cold War, uh, Finnish national identity was constructed by portraying Russia as the other, the big other person uh, or enemy. Uh, so, uh, Finnish-Russian border was open for interaction and for mass visits in 1991. And the uh, Finnish property market was basically closed for foreigners, but in 2000, after the EU integration properties, property market was open also to uh, foreigners outside the European Union. So, that's when Russians uh, came to purchase properties in Finland. So. Um, and uh, newspapers were very <laughs> um, generous in uh, speaking about the phenomena and generally we can define three main discourses. Um, Russian property purchases or second home ownership was portrayed as Russian invasion, that Russians will come and buy Finland out piece, piece by piece and then resettle in Finland. Um, uh, Russian uh, second home ownership was portrayed as a threat to national landscape because they will buy out all the lake shores and create uh, closed enclaves and Russian uh, second home villages. And that Finnish national landscape is a lake landscape. Um, and uh, third discourse was related to uh, displacement of locals by pricing out uh, locals from the second home market that. Russian demand will increase property prices and that will uh, hinder the possibilities of locals to purchase properties. 
From 2014, uh, after the Ukrainian crisis and an accession of Crimea, second homes are increasingly viewed as a security issue. It's not a tourism activity anymore. And there have been even estimations that Russian properties could be used as a uh, could be used in hybrid war. <laughs> so there's um, from tourism to a security debate. Well, anyway, uh, what have I discovered in my study uh, that I did in my doctoral dissertation? I looked into motivations, the role of the border, uh, on mutual relations between Russian and Finns, and spatial distribution of Russian properties. And here I am trying to get to a second, Russian second home. So I uh, collected interviews with Russian owners and I showed you the, uh, the research area. By the way, I forgot to mention that uh, the total amount of Russian properties in Finland is not high. If we here, we can estimate that Germans owed up to 70,000 properties. Uh, in Finland, it's about 4,500 properties. And again, the property means a piece of land with or without a building on it, because that's how it's registered in Finland. The amount of apartments or other types of properties, I, I don't have these numbers, so it could be higher, and it is higher, I think. And 4,500 Russians and other foreigners altogether about 2,500. So it's, um, Russians are the biggest group of foreign property owners. So then from the same region, I also collected survey with Finnish local inhabitants and second homeowners, and also to use geographical coordinates and other topographical databases in my study. So what are the motives why Russians are coming uh, to buy properties in Finland? And here are the listed the uh, so-called static motives to, ha uh, to own a second home uh, that we can find from the literature. However, when we talk to Russians, we can see that uh, these motives uh, get a di bit different interpretation that, than we have in the literature. Inversion or change in lifestyle is basically one of the strongest motives to have a second home. And in Finland, and if we have, again, Russian coming from metropolitan area of St. Petersburg with six million inhabitants, and he enters Finland and Finnish countryside, so it's a big change and a big difference. And here we can have a, um, a proof to that. I mean, it's not that sparkling as many countries, so it's not so bustling, not so lively. Quite slow, but it fits me very much. Um, so. Uh, relaxation is another important motive because uh, it's considered that when people come to second home, they don't have to adapt to a new place. It's the same uh, location, it's the same familiar place, so you can relax right away. However, relaxation for Russians is about comfort. They want good and well-equipped dwellings. Uh, they are not interested to drive all the way from Russia and do the dishes or laundry. And uh, relaxation is about uh, quietness, that it's quiet in Finland. And it's very possible that in Finland you have second home and the closest neighbor is about one or two kilometers away. So it's really a countryside. Uh, nature is an important motive. And in literature, usually nature is about being with nature and sp uh, spend uh, time in natural way, which is, uh, was very true about Finnish second homes. Then they do not have electricity or water or be uh, with nature. However, in the uh, case of Russians, we, have, we can divide this motive into three small ones. It's about wild places or untouched nature. And here we can see uh, su support to that. When you boat on Lake Saima, it's very pleasant there because everything is a state of nature. These places are very wild. Uh, nature is also about similarity. Russians are coming from Northwest Russia, which is a very uh, Nature-wise, is very similar, similar clim climatic conditions, similar scene. We do not have palms in Finland, so you do not face a big contrast, which is also an important for Russians. And also amenity or beauty, beauty of places. Uh, walking in the forest, uh, glad I don't have any potatoes or flower beds, just forests, not like a second home in Russia. So it's a um, desirable difference in Finland. Um, Activities that's related to, uh, to that, as well as personal and cultural motives are very important, uh, especially uh, in Russia. Uh, you cannot have a lake shore in property. Shores are uh, in 
you cannot own a shore, but in Finland you can, so you have, can have your second home and you have a part of shore, a piece of shore that can be yours. Um, and in Russia, this second home tradition is 300 years old, so it's very much rooted and it's considered, I think, 17 million uh, Russians are using uh, second home or having second home, which is a big number. And uh, motives for second home location, Russians are coming, as I mentioned, from St. Petersburg and even from Moscow. One third of my respondents came from Moscow, which is 1,200 um, kilometers away, and it's about 18 hours drive. Uh, that's um, a long way. Uh, however, it didn't stop Russians to buy, purchase a property in, in Finland. Um, why Finland? Uh, first of all, the image of the country, and the most important component of image of Finland is safety. So and here is an important citation I tell everywhere <laughs> all the time. Whatever you do here, you will not be afraid that somebody, somebody, somebody will break in, something will be stolen. To have something like this in Russia, you have to build a fence, all security system, and you cannot leave it for a while unattended. So in Finland, it's very safe. Uh, even here in Gran Canaria, we see that people put shutters uh, when we leave the properties. In Finland, people do not do that. It's, it's generally safe, even in the middle of the forest. So the, uh, one of the respondents said that the scariest thing can be that a wild animal can walk into your yard in, in the second home in Finland. That's the scariest thing. Uh, so Russians had a very positive image about Finland. Uh, also, environment is an important uh, motive for like, a property location. Uh, also, in terms of, I said, wild places or a beautiful nature, and about build environment. One of the respondents said that it's so nicely you cross the border and you please try the way everything uh, is, flowers are nicely uh, hanging and the lawns are cut, so it's so neat and nicely in Finland. Uh, also, price. Again, uh, I uh, conducted interviews in uh, hello in 2010. So uh, back then, when the rubble was still more stable, uh, the price uh, for a second home in Finland was cheaper, according to my respondents, than in uh, metropolitan regions of Moscow or Saint Petersburg. And one of the respondents said, "You are saying so nicely a cottage in Russia. If you cannot afford a cottage in Russia." And a particular location, uh, as I said, most of the properties are located by the border uh, as the result of the real estate offers. So, and um, there are some places where Russians are located next to each other, but it's not uh, because they desire to, to, to be next to other Russians, but because they ended up due to the uh, real estate offers. Uh, so the border in uh, second home ownership. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Timothy Dowland uh, talk about water as barrier, as attraction, and as modifier of tourism landscape. Uh, my research case also shows the border as opportunity. Uh, well, let's go through them. A border as barrier, um, and uh, here are citations from my respondents. Uh, things restrict our length of stay, which means visa regime. Uh, that Russians can stay only half a year per year maximum uh, based on the property ownership. And also language barrier is an obstacle. So it's a real border in, for integration and to, for, uh, for, uh, for leisure in Finland. Border as an attraction, as I mentioned, you cross the border and you please drive away. So Russians are very attracted by the Finnish environment. Uh, as well as uh, importance of Finland as a place for safe investment. Finland today and hope for a long time is famous for the fact that real estate is real, that's immovable, nobody will take it from you, that it's very secure, so it's very attractive uh, for Russians. And border as opportunity, um, and um, again, Russians get a possibility of lakeshore ownership and uh, also opportunity for safe uh, leisure conditions that are different uh, from Russia. So, um, oh, sorry. Uh, so that uh, provides border provides a better opportunity for better leisure conditions, and it's important that there is a border uh, between Finland and Russia, at least according to my results, because it marks these positive differences. 
uh, and safeguards the leisure conditions uh, in Finland. So when we plot, um, uh, when you have uh, a plot of land, uh, we have a shore lake. So you have a lake, and you can own the uh, the the lake shore. This is uh, in Russia you cannot, in Finland you can. So it's a very attractive um, difference and opportunity. And um, so now we can see um, the results of the survey and uh, attitudes of Finnish local residents and second homeowners from the study region. Uh, we can see that the majority of co Finnish uh, cottage owners and locals think that Russian possibilities to buy properties in Finland should be restricted. Uh, and again, we have on the background the social debate, the uneasy historical past between the two countries. So it's predominantly negative attitudes to, towards the phenomena. So also um, uh, locals and second homeowners uh, agree or strongly agree with the following statements. And here you can see locals, L, and cottage owners or second homeowners, the percentage. So uh, they agree, a uh, majority of the respondents agree that Russian uh, interest raised the property prices. Um, that Russian buy properties that are meant for permanent residents. That's why they changed the uh, local communities. Um, so uh, Finnish possibilities to buy uh, properties uh, have decreased due to the Russian interest. interest. And so about half of the respondents agree with that. Um, and Russians are uh, buying uh, from the same areas, again, forming ethnic enclaves, which according to my results haven't been supported, but still Finns have the strong opinion about that. And uh, Russians buy the best places, meaning the lake shore location and the places uh, where Finns would like to have uh, their second homes. So interactions, when we ask uh, how often you are in contact with Russians and Russians with local Finns, uh, okay, uh, language barrier uh, leaves uh, contacts uh, from the Russian side to occasional greetings, or only one respondent mentioned that they visit, uh, have mutual visits with their neighbors, but that's a very limited um, category of, of Russians who do that. Uh, things uh, say, um, again, occasional greetings, but they also provide certain neighboring help to their Russian owner and maybe get some additional income because they have a Russian um, uh, neighbor. Um, however, half of the respondents, or a bit more than half, say that they have Russian second homeowner in their same neighborhood or village. However, majority of them have never been in contact with Russian second homeowner. Um, when we ask them about would they like to be more in contact with Russians, or Russians would like to be more in contact with Finns, and of course Russians would like to integrate more, they plan to learn the language, and they generally want to know about what, who are their neighbors, what do, do they do, where do they work. Um, Finns would like to have occasional but not very frequent contacts. And as we can see, half of the respondents would like to have no or very rare contacts with Russians. And however, almost half of the respondents think that it's important to have good relations with Russians. But still, majority of them would not like to have contacts with Russians. Uh, about many op major obstacles for uh, mutual interactions, Russians may mentioned the language barrier and also cultural barrier that, uh, as they say, it's not very common that you go to your neighbor, knock on the door and say hi and go inside. In Finland, it's not like that. <laughs> uh, you usually agree in advance and decide what you're going to do and so on and so forth. So Russians are very, um, how to say, they don't, don't want to disturb, so they are afraid to act in an inappropriate way. Um, so Finns um, have lots of prejudices about Russians. Again, we have a historical past, we have uh, media publication about the phenomena that affects their opinions. Um, we have this fear of Russian invasion, uh, cultural difference, intolerance, and even racism. And among the citations or open-ended questions, we're talking about Finland for Finns. 
so which is a very nationalistic uh, statement, and the land that was protected by my grandfather should not be sold to Russians or to other foreigners. However, it was an interesting differentiation that other EU nationals are welcome. <laughs> so, yeah. And, uh, well, coming to the end, uh, the highlights of my study is uh, what I tried to uh, theorize in my doctoral thesis is to develop the concept of this east to west mobility that differentiates from other mobility flows within Europe and is categorized by uh, overcoming uh, bigger economic uh, and political um, distance in a way because the border marks one of the greatest economic differences between the neighboring countries in the world. The other border is US-Mexican. That's basically similar difference than the Finnish-Russian border. Uh, so it's important to study borders uh, in uh, international second home ownership uh, and in general international mobility, recreation mobility. And it's important to pay attention to outcomes because outcome of a second home ownership, it could be negative publicity, it could be negative uh, attitudes, but it could be also a spatial change. Uh, as here, for example, in Gran Canaria, we can see that there are many second homes who are in the middle of tourist areas, but they are not here most of the time of the year. So how we address this change and how we um, do we want to uh, pay attention to that change? So outcome is an important uh, thing to take into account when we talk about and plan uh, for second homes, uh, for second home development. So thank you, and if you have any questions. Mm -hmm.